Welcome to Chapter 9. Chapter 9 focuses on students with physical and health disabilities and we'll see how we can better prepare our classrooms and better prepare lessons to help serve students that have any health or physical disabilities in your classroom. As usual, let's start out with what IDEA has to say. IDEA 2004 uses the term orthopedic impairments. And under the umbrella of this definition, students with physical disabilities have problems with the structure or functioning of a part of their body. This includes impairments caused by a congenital abnormality, um, it could be due to a disease, or other causes such as cerebral palsy or amputations. IDEA also looks at special health care needs and uses the term other health impairment. You may also hear this referred to as OHI. IDEA describes these students as having limited strength, chronic or acute health problems, and these once again have to affect their educational performance. I can tell you from my experience in the schools, students with um, severe health uh, disabilities tend to miss a lot of school. So the provision of services to this population may include you doing home visits, visit to hospitals, providing that extra care students need in order to learn and grow. Well, let's look at some physical disabilities. These are neuromotor impairments, and these conditions include the nerves, muscles, and motor functioning. Under this category, this can include seizure disorders, cerebral palsy, any spinal cord disorders, polio, muscular dystrophy, and multiple sclerosis. There also may be muscular or skeletal conditions. These conditions affecting muscles or bones resulting in limited functioning. These are very low prevalence, but they do include juvenile diabetes, limb deficiencies, and skeletal disorders. Some chronic illnesses students may experience in your classroom. Here's a good one to know for the exam. The most common one you're going to come across is asthma. Asthma is extremely prevalent among students in, in schools today. And like I've mentioned in previous videos, a lot of it can be due to environmental effects. There's tuberculosis, childhood cancer, cystic fibrosis, any type of genetical heart defects, blood disorders, and diabetes. Another area is also called infectious diseases. This can be HIV and AIDS, hepatitis B, or STORCH. Definitely check out what that actually means. Look in your textbook. The S-T-O-R-C-H stands for a chronic set of infectious diseases that you might come across. Everything from uh, syphilis, herpes, uh, uh, they're all in there. Check it out. It's not going to be on the exam, but it's good to know if somebody goes, what's STORCH? No, it's a collection of infectious diseases, not a disease unto itself. Let's look at one common term and one common disability that may occur in your classroom. The first one is epilepsy. Epilepsy can involve the entire brain, which, which will then cause generalized seizures or only part of the brain and result in partial seizures in the student within your classroom. Some students with epilepsy can actually feel a seizure coming on. I'm going to mention the different types of seizures, but I do not expect you to know them for the exam. The important thing is if you have students in your classroom that are prone to having seizures, you should be prepared on how to intervene and keep the students safe at all times. This is where communication is going to be critical. There's absence, simple partial, complex partial, and generalized tonic-clonic. I am not going to test you on these. However, if you have students with any one of these types of seizures in your classroom, it's going to be important for you to go out and research and find out what you can do to better prepare for seizures in your class. Here's a video that might help clear up some additional questions you may have.
डोंट पैनिक जस्ट मूव बैक मूव एनी पोटेंशियली हार्मफुल ऑब्जेक्ट आउट ऑफ हार्म्स वे टू प्रिवेंट इंजरी Do not restrain the person and give him or her head support. After the seizure ends, move the person on to the side. Tilt his or her head back. to protect against choking from possible vomiting how to give emergency medical aid to seizure patients move any potentially harmful objects out of harm's way to prevent injury do not restrain him or her from moving provide head support and wait for the attack to end After the seizure attack eases, move the person on to the side and tilt his or her head back to prevent choking. If you should see someone having a seizure, it's first of all, it's most important not to panic and get upset about it. You really need to try and help that person out. So, depending on the how the seizure presents, if it's a confusional episode, you're just sort of following them around and making sure they don't come to any harm. If it's a big generalized tonic-clonic seizure, you need to put the person down on the ground or on the floor, turn them on their side so that they're not going to choke if they spit up or they vomit and let the seizure run its course. When they're laying on their side, what's important is put a pillow underneath their head. If they're banging or jerking around, don't restrain them. Just sort of keep them in one place so they don't fall off a bed or fall off a chair and make them comfortable. Do not put your hands in their mouth. Absolutely not unless you want to get your fingers bitten off. So you, it's an old wives tale is that you're supposed to put something in their mouth to protect them. Do not put anything near their mouth. Turn them on their side. protect them from harm if there's furniture nearby that they can bang against and get hurt move that out of the way and let it just run its course and keep them comfortable without panicking without getting upset typically if it's some if it's a stranger that you've never seen before you should call 911 if it's somebody who's known to have seizures and it's their seizures are usually self-limiting and they last less than usually 5 minutes so just let it run its course and keep them comfortable i think what scares people the most is that that gagging choking sound that you can hear but we know that that is just part of the seizure and that they're not having problems breathing and if you have them in a good position laying on their side with their head to their side they're not going to swallow their tongue they're not going to choke and so you could just let them go through that and then very frequently they have the snoring sound after the seizure ends that sounds really scary uh but that usually passes as well the other thing that often happens is that people turn sort of blue and whoever is with them the rescuers or the family members will think that they're not breathing but actually they usually do continue to breathe it's just that the blood is going away from their mouth and their lungs and their heart to their brain so you don't have to worry so much about respirations and that sort of thing turn them on the side keep them safe call for help and um let it run its course okay hopefully that video was helpful in helping you better prepare for students with seizure disorders in your classroom Let's go on to some other characteristics of common health disabilities you might see in your class. Next one is cerebral palsy. And the severity of this disability depends on the location, the degree, and the extent of the precise brain damage the student had suffered. When motor functioning is affected, students can have jerky movements, they can suffer from spasms, 
and a lack of muscle tone. Remember, there is a wide range of functioning associated with students with cerebral palsy. Some, that, some are going to be severely affected, some are going to be mildly affected by the condition. When we go back to think about uh, chapter four in speech and language impairments, we know that speech may be severely affected if motor uh, functioning is, is severely, excuse me, severely affected, meaning that if they have motor issues, speech is going to be extremely difficult. And a lot of times intellectual functioning can be completely present. However, motor functioning can uh, get in the way of speech and language. There may be some degree of intellectual disabilities, and this is uh, present in approximately half of the children that have been diagnosed with CP. Some students are intellectually gifted, once again, on that continuous bell curve, and it should never be assumed that students with cerebral palsy and intellectual disabilities always occur in the same combination. Remember, it's all about treating the individual. Another common um, health disorder that can be found in classrooms is sickle cell anemia. This is a heredity life-threatening blood disorder. 95% of all cases occur amongst African Americans. The symptoms include extreme pain, swollen joints, and possibly fevers, even strokes. So if you have students with this uh, with sickle cell anemia in your classroom, it's gonna be important for you to work with parents and work with the child to find out how you could better serve them and make sure they're comfortable in your class. So how prevalent are these disabilities? Well, determining the exact prevalence with students with health and disabilities is extremely difficult. There's no national health registry that has a list of students under a specific set of conditions. Many of these conditions can coexist and not all of these are going to require special education services. In 2006-2007, 11% of all students included within this disability category. This health disability ca category, however, is one of the fastest growing areas. Why is that? We know one specific disability from Chapter 6 is covered under this, and that is ADHD. Since it doesn't have its own category, if you remember, it's covered under OHI. Okay, let's break it down by percentages. Not that you need to know this, but I want you to see prevalence levels and how frequently these occur in your classroom. When it comes to asthma, almost 10% of our population of children is affected by this health impairment. When it comes to cerebral palsy, far less than 1%. It's low prevalence. Same with epilepsy. We have less than 5% of students. Um, these are students ages 13 to 24 that have um, immune acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. 8% have sickle cell anemia. Diabetes is way too prevalent at 20, 22% for children under the age of 20. And for cystic fibrosis, which is an extremely, extremely damaging um, lung disorder, we're, thank God it's less than one in 2,000 children. So what are some of the causes and prevention tactics we can use for students with physical and health impairments? Well, let's look at some causes. We know there are allergies and infections. It could be related to heredity. Accidents and injuries. We know our kids are very prone to accidents at a young age. A lot of them not, thank God we're doing some things with uh, helmet safety, doing better at keeping our kids safe. There are also multiple other factors that can be involved, but most of them are unknown. How can we prevent some of these? We know good prenatal care, universal immunizations, helping them avoid injuries and helping keeping them safe, and improved hygiene. But how can you as teachers help in the classroom? By referring sick students to the school nurse and keeping parents better informed, keeping play area and objects in your classroom disinfected. I'm gonna tell you one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen on this planet 
are those plastic ball pits. My students used to help care for those at the elementary school level and we take all the balls out of the pit and disinfect them. I don't even want to tell you what we found at the bottom. In fact, you know what the least disgusting thing we found was used band-aids. Absolutely gross. Make sure you keep your classroom a clean, healthy environment. Have students wash their hands frequently. Use disposable gloves when you're cleaning up an accident. And if you are using gloves, find out if any of your students have any latex allergies. If you do, get the appropriate gloves from the school nurse and use all hygienic precautions in your classroom. As far as medical advances go, surgery can help repair spinal columns. We've gotten much better at being able to provide medical services to injured students. However, when we talk about students with more moderate to intensive disabilities later on in chapter uh, 12, we'll find out that you know, we're doing, doctors are doing a great job at saving the lives of some of these children, but some of them do result in some intellectual disabilities down the road, and that'll be um, when we talk about students with traumatic brain injury. I want you to be very familiar, and hopefully I'll be able to show you a video here in a moment, of shunts. Shunts can be placed in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the brain to help drain fluid, which prevents intellectual disabilities for students with spina bifida. If they do have shunts installed, it's gonna be important for you to understand the procedures for if a student bumps their head, if they slip and fall. Some of these things come with a very strict code of I get procedures if the students you know bumped in any way there's been significant advances in assistive devices wheelchairs are becoming much more efficient prosthetic devices are on the rise and the use of computer technology so let's look at a couple of these a CSF shunt involves insertion of a valve that regulates and drains the excess cerebral fluid from a patient's brain the operation normally takes less than an hour and it is a common procedure done by skilled neurosurgeons. Incisions are made to the head and abdomen. Tubes are then passed through the fatty tissue under the skin. A small hole is made in the skull to allow the ventricular tube to be passed into the lateral ventricle. The peritoneal tube is then placed into the abdomen to allow the fluid to drain. After surgery, the patient will typically spend up to seven days in hospital to ensure the procedure has been successful. A far more effective solution exists in the form of an adjustable valve. This shunt is identical in every respect to the fixed valve, but critically allows the physician to make small adjustments to the pressure setting by using a remote magnetic programmer, eliminating the need for further invasive surgery and ensuring the best possible improvement for the patient. Okay, as in every chapter we talk about assessment, but for this spe specific population, early identification usually takes place at birth or shortly after. So typically as a teacher, you're not gonna to be too, much, too far involved in the identification process. And it's gonna be important for you as a teacher who's gonna see these students on a daily basis, being able to see them interact with same age peers. You're gonna be the first one to notice any significant changes in the health or physical status of your students. So if you see something that looks a little bit off, looks a little bit different, it's going to be important for you to communicate that to parents. But generally, most of these students are typically identified before they get to school. But how can we better accommodate them when it comes to testing? The most common ones are scheduling some extra time, placing these students in a, dis in a distraction-free setting, possibly reading the directions to them out loud or simplifying the directions for them during a testing procedure and assisting them during the test, maybe reading each item or a scribe for them, which means you'd be actually writing the answer down or keystroking the um, information into a computer after the student responds. So when it comes to early intervention for this population, we wanna focus on the development of motor responses getting students to take full advantage of the, um, basically the, mu the muscle tone that they have left, making sure they're able to um, take advantage 
of every, every positive aspect, teaching them body awareness, motor planning, and mobility skills. These are the things that are gonna help set the stage for independence and allow them to go out there and have more control over their lives. We wanna make sure these students are encouraged to communicate. All members of the multiple disciplinary team should be involved in making sure the student's program is effective and for those of you who are going to have students in the classroom that need appropriate positioning, let's take a look at some of the standards you may be using in your classroom. Because having students positioned appropriately, having them um, take full advantage of any type of physical therapy, which I spoke about earlier in the semester, I want to make sure you see exactly what I'm talking about. So remember, positioning is key. All right, let's take a look at some of the standards and some of the equipment you might find in your classroom. As you can see, some of this, some of this equipment can appear to be fairly technical. If you have these students in your class that use equipment such as this, you should be coordinating with the school's physical therapist, occupational therapist, and school nurse to become an expert in how to use this equipment. There are multiple safety features that need to be followed. I can tell you from experience, your job at the elementary school level, helping students uh, being positioned, helping them stand, is gonna improve digestion for, uh, for eating, it's gonna help increase muscle tone, it's gonna help them be better included, it, and it just, it will keep them more alert during your lessons, there's no doubt about it. These procedures can take some time, but you have to work them into your classroom. This is meeting the needs of all of your students, and there's nothing more important you can do than, than to help a young child remain mobile rather than you know, being, um, being forced to use a wheelchair for mobility for the rest of their lives. Early intervention is critical. All right, beyond physical, pos physical positioning in your classroom, what else can you do to help teach students with physical and health disabilities? Well, remember, each student's gonna have individual needs. Many students are gonna require flexible schedules, some additional time maybe changing between classes or activities, and they're gonna need some additional assistance. All students with physical disabilities require a learning environment that's, that's free of physical barriers. You wanna make sure students are able to move freely around your classroom. So it's gonna take time for you to set your classroom up to make sure it's easily accessible. Remember, check out some stores in your community. As much as they might have a, an automatic door that opens up, can they really effectively move through the aisles and move through the racks in some of your local stores? In many cases, they can't. So it's gonna be important for you to have a classroom that's free of physical barriers. These students should have access to the general education curriculum. Approximately half of the students spend a good portion of the day in the general education environment. And teachers who plan relevant activities can encourage students to work together to help students fully access a curriculum. As far as instructional accommodations go, successful practices for students with health, health disabilities include the provision of a home or hospital teacher for students that are at home for, a long, uh, for long periods due to illness, technology and video conferencing so lessons aren't missed. That's one of the reasons I put these videos together. It's much easier for students to learn seeing me, uh, looking at the PowerPoints, viewing other videos rather than studying on their own. Some of you are going to learn just by hearing the, you know, the wonderful tone of my voice if you're listening to this on headphones. Others will learn just from seeing the information appear on the screen. As, as many avenues as you can to reach your students you want to try to take, whether it's auditory, visual, home visits, all of that. You can videotape special events and activities and class sessions for your students to view if they've missed it. You could also use a note taker or a peer tutor. Use distance learning. I'm sure in the next couple of years, this is going to take off like crazy since technology has become so accessible. And successful practices for students with physical disabilities, allowing extra time, the use of technology, 
uh, carbon paper so students are taking notes. This is probably an old practice. Now all notes can be typed out and are easily accessible. A lot of text, uh, voice to text uh, technology is out there. And making a recording of assignments for students, just like I do in this class. Making sure you understand exactly what the expectations are for each assignment, along with visual examples. Why do I do this? Because I know for most of you, that's going to reduce your anxiety. If you know exactly what's expected, I'm more likely to get what I'm expecting. And that's how the educational process works. It's a give and take. And the more students know, the better they're going to be prepared to meet your, your educational demands. All right, database practices for this population. Your textbook focuses under the concept of universal design. And ADA requirements of accessibility are not always done under the spirit of the law. You have to remember older buildings are exempt until they remodel. So we want to establish barrier-free learning environments. Let's look at what the spirit of ADA is all about and let's check out this video. This historic act is the world's first comprehensive declaration of equality for people with disabilities, the first. I now lift my pen to sign this Americans with Disability Act and say, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. God bless you all. I really believe that people with disabilities are the greatest untapped resource in this country today. The ADA has given us the right to travel the sidewalks and streetscapes of our country. The ADA was the critical linchpin of uh, you know changing things, and, and now it's an ongoing process of using it to try to create these kinds of changes. ADA's done just fantastic things with people that are blind, people in wheelchairs, getting up public transportation. The big thing that I see is in transportation for me, being able to travel around the country independently in a power wheelchair to just about any city in the country is definitely a factor of the ADA. People with disabilities are out and about and one of the reasons they're out and about is because the ADA required that um, transportation providers make their services, make their transportation accessible. No one would have installed curb cuts if it weren't for people with disabilities. Now everyone uses them. The transportation systems are getting more and more comfortable, you know, working with people with disabilities and it's just, you know, I've just seen huge changes in that area. It doesn't do uh, a person with a disability much good if they can apply for a job and they get the job if they can't actually get to work. We have more technology today, everything from not only uh, desktop electronic magnifiers, but we now have pocket magnifiers that are electronic and allow us to be mobile with those types of uh, magnification devices. Where um, some of the assistive technology can be really helpful is with some of the uh, nonverbal people with autism. Some of these people do have a good brain in there. They can learn to type independently. Now many movie theaters have open captions, so I can go to a movie on opening day just like uh, hearing individuals can. When I go to a hotel, I have a visible fire alarm if there were to be a fire. They have equipment there that makes it accessible for me, uh, like alarm clocks that vibrate, TTYs. I know that people with disabilities 
want to go to work. You know, they want to feel the pride of earning a paycheck, and they have talents that uh, they can contribute. Particularly for the blind community, we experience about a 70% unemployment rate when compared to the rest of society. If people want a new job, uh, they can get an interpreter for the interview and be able to secure that job. So I think the Americans with Disabilities Act has impacted deaf people's lives in a variety of ways. The ADA Amendments Act is really about bringing down barriers and providing people with disabilities uh, not only access to accommodations and public buildings and stuff, but access to opportunities. I think the biggest struggle of people dealing with mental health issues is, um, is to have the public acknowledge uh, that, that they are discriminated against. Uh, that it is a disability and they do face discrimination. When people that have a hidden disability, uh, they're going to need accommodations like being away from fluorescent lights, have a quiet place to work. Those are two really important accommodations and those are usually easy to do. We have so many uh, veterans who have been wounded in combat uh, now coming home and are going to need the, the proper support so that they can enter the workforce. <laughs> It would be my hope that people use the act to continue to achieve the basic rights that they're entitled to, that everybody has and that everybody wants. And the younger generation definitely needs to know what their rights are, but also to take that responsibility of leading the charge now and moving this forward. And it's really only now, 20 years after the ADA, that people have a full complement of resources. Disability in general is an equal opportunity condition and that the longer we live, the older we get, each one of us has the opportunity to acquire a disability. I may be the, uh, uh, the first quadriplegic to serve in the United States Congress, but I most certainly won't be the last. ADA has certainly provided uh, a great vehicle and a, a pathway for people with disabilities to succeed. Hopefully in the next 10 to 20 years we'll make that much more progress. All right, let's look at some technology issues for this population. When it comes to assistive technology, IDEA and the courts have clarified that their roles are related services. And IDEA does not cover medical services provided by physicians. It includes high-tech devices such as computers, ventilators, voice, voice software and hardware if it's needed. It also can include low-tech devices such as book holders or uh, built up spoons. The key here is individualizing and creativity are the keys to problem solving. Let's take a look at a number of different devices that can help our students access the information they're gonna need in order to learn. Hi, I'm Lacey Cook and I teach in the vocational program here at Campbell Collegiate. I believe technology is an essential tool in the classroom because it helps facilitate student participation. This is particularly true with my students, many of whom are nonverbal or have physical and cognitive limitations. The use of laptop computers has changed the way I teach and how my class functions.
Okay, we are trying to do a crossword with Christopher Newman. He prefers Chris. This is Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you a question for a crossword, okay? Is it too hard? No? Yes? Yes, it is too hard. That's a yes from him. Do you enjoy using your computer more? Yes, that's another yes from him. As you can see, sometimes it's difficult to know what he is saying, but with your computer, Chris, you can talk to us way better, right? Okay, this is what Chris did today. He wrote with using his mouse, which this is his mouse that goes through and selects um, a bunch of different options through the keyboard and he will press the key every time it comes onto the letter. He wrote, I like using my computer because it helps me to talk. I email assignments, I use PowerPoint presentations, and I have designed a website that my students can access regularly. Tell me what do you think about computers? T H E they C A N they can H E L P they can help you're right do they help you yeah do you like using them does it make your assignments a little easier spell it out for me K I N D a kinda <laughs> okay but right now but right now she paused her eyes beginning to water I just don't know what to believe okay what do we think the main idea is with that do we think Jamie's eyes are bright and intense when she is upset do we think that it's B? Dez and Dad have told Jamie they love her. Is it C? Jamie is unsure. Now students are more willing to participate. We are building relationships and making connections that were not there before we made technology our main focus. And tell us why you like your computer and why it helps you. You just got it this year. Uh, because. I can do stuff easier. Like, my work easier. Yeah? Because sometimes, what else do you have trouble with? You have trouble seeing small print, hey? Okay? Yeah. So, what does your computer do for you? It magnifies. It magnifies it, yeah. What's that program called? Do you know? A zoom text. Zoom text. Yes. Do you have trouble writing as well? Computer. Not on the computer. Yeah, well, before it used to take a long time for Sean to get assignments done. And now, what do you think? It takes you're twice as fast as you were before? Yeah. Yeah, it really helps. I also hope to teach my students the value of technology and using it. This knowledge will enable them to have valuable work experiences in the community. My vision for my classroom is to teach them more about new technology that's coming out every day so that they can transfer those skills into their work experiences in the future and then continue on using it in the future. Thank you. Technology! Help us succeed! And yes! We love technology! 
So what does transition through adulthood look like th for this population? Regardless of whether or not the student will go to college or independent living, the goal for most students is as much independence as possible. High school transition plans can have a positive impact on students becoming more independent. They can help students learn to be responsible for planning their own future. They can help students be better advocate, advocates for themselves, l helping them learn to locate their needed resources and take an active role in the medical treatment and management that they're a, a central part of. These students should know how to access the healthcare system. They should know how to get to the doctors. They should know when they're going to be in need of medical attention. However, one aspect of this I really want you to be familiar with is the use of service or assistance animals. These are individually trained animals that can assist individuals with a disability. And this could help them become more mobile. Some are even there to help them uh, work through seizures. But there are a number of rules with the interaction of service animals. You should always speak to the first in person first and never distract the service animal. They're there to do a specific job. You need to be willing to ask and receive permission before touching the animal. You can't go up and just go, oh, what a cute dog, and start petting it. That's not what the service animal is there for. Do not offer food to the service animal at any time. And don't be offended if the handler doesn't want to talk. It's an all an individual, individual decision. Let's take a quick look to help you get better prepared at working with individuals that use service animals. It's important to approach people that have a service dog properly in a way that's not going to interfere with how their service dog works. Generally, you should never pet a service dog. If you really want to pet a service dog, you can ask, but the person may say no, and you need to accept that in some cases they're not going to let you pet their dog. Petting a service dog can distract them and can put the person that uses them in danger. Also, you don't want to call to a service dog or make little kissing noises or whistle at them because that can also distract them from the work they're trying to do. In addition, you never want to give food to a service dog unless you have the permission of the, the dog's handler. Most service dogs are on a very strict diet and messing with their, their diet can cause problems that would interfere with their work or make them sick. When it comes to collaboration with related service providers, this group of individuals will have a much wider team in, in a sense that there are going to be many more service professionals working with the students because they, if they do have some intensive medical needs, they're going to need some more services in the classroom, in the school setting. First off, let's look at physical therapists. Physical therapists evaluate the quality of students' movements and can help, te help students um, teach them how to compensate for motor, motor difficulties. In many cases, the classroom teacher can be a tremendous advocate in helping students reach their therapeutic goals. Meaning once the physical therapist has you know, left the room, you could come up with you know, working with the, with, the, with the PT. What can you do to help the student gain additional strength? Are there exercises you can do with the student while in your classroom? There are also occupational therapists. These individuals help students access and work with students on fine motor skills, upper body movements, and daily living skills. They're extremely, an extremely vital part of any student's education. And then of, of course, the school nurse. They are much more prevalent at the elementary school level, but in many schools, nurses are the case managers for students in the general education classroom. Their duties may include being the community li liaison, health interpretation to school personnel, the coordination of related services, the facilitator of communication with assisting transitions, and they are a primary advocate for students at this level. Families, of course, are always going to be a vital part of the student's life and oftentimes they are going to be overwhelmed. They might turn to the schools and teachers for help. If this happens, here's a list of a, of a few agencies that you might be able to uh, send the family to. However, in this area, you'd want to be uh, contacting uh, Children's Hospital, finding out a myriad of services that you can give the parent. It's important for you to get prepared. Get to know the community. Get to know the services that are available so you can give this information to parents so they can better access it. 
All right, let's review some of the questions from chapter nine. How do you think you do with this one? Got the answer? Right, you wanna make sure you're well-trained to avoid any child injuries. Let's try another one. This is actually from one of the first slides from this chapter. Correct, an orthopedic impairment. This is how IDEA defines these uh, physical limitations. Last one, how are you gonna do? Hope you remembered. Yep, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, if you have any further questions, you always know to contact myself or Sarah Noble. Uh, looking forward to work you, working with you on the next couple of chapters. We'll be talking about students with hearing impairments and students with vision impairments next.